Well, needless to say, this might have been one of the strangest Daytona Speed Weeks I can ever recall watching. And we're going to go through it all, so let's get into it. This is Final Analysis. <laughs> What's happening, ladies and germs? This is the Packer Man, and this is Final Analysis Uncensored. Basically, basically, this is the uncensored version of my review. So if you hear F-bombs and other kinds of crap, well, that's why this is called Uncensored. So let's get into it. So, Speed Weeks 2019. One of the weirdest Speed Weeks I can ever recall watching. Of course, it all started with the clash on the 10th, I believe. And, uh, well, <laughs> that race was a total disaster. Between the choo-choo train that we saw during that race, the rain delays, and then, of course, the accident at the end. I mean, might as well go ahead and say it. The race was a clusterfuck. And then, of course, there was the controversy of, you know, Johnson basically, well, for the lack of a better term, causing the accident, whether intentionally or unintentionally, is a moot point. The fact of the matter is, he tried to make the move, which I will give him credit for, though. He made the move for the win. It just didn't work out as cleanly as I think he would have hoped. Now, of course, he did get the win because he was the leader at the time the caution came out and then the rains came and he was declared the winner. And there were not a whole lot of people, there were not a whole lot of people that were happy about that. And of course, he had his uh, defenders and unfortunately, when something like this happens, well, the entire NASCAR community starts going at each other's throats. So, basically... It reignited the NASCAR Civil War. Oh, and of course I left this comment in one of the videos where, where everybody was just tearing each other apart basically over the incident. And it's just like good grief. But yeah, the uh, clash was a disaster. And I remember giving that race a 0 out of 10. Because it was total garbage. It was a dumpster fire. It was a toxic waste landfill. There was nothing, absolutely nothing, redeemable about the clash. And for once, I agree with Kevin Harvick. And a little bit of backstory. Um, I don't like Kevin Harvick like at all. I mean, it was because of that incident in 2015 at Talladega. That nearly made me stop watching NASCAR altogether. Now I stopped watching for two years. But I came back in 2018. 2018 was kind of up and down. But you know, my hatred for Kevin Harvick still, um, is still pretty strong. But for once I actually agree with Kevin Harvick. He basically said we need to just dump the clash. From the schedule. Because it's pointless. And I for once agree with them. The Clash hasn't been good for several years now. And quite frankly, it's a complete waste of time. And <laughs> the 2019 Clash was basically a prime example of that. So the Clash needs to go. And that's, that's all I got to say about that. Now we get to the duels. And... In both of those duels, this was what I was almost about to do. It sucked ass! Ever since they came up with this charter system, the duels, for the most part, have been basically worthless as well. Even though they tried to add some stakes by bringing championship points back into the equation, the duels have also been kind of pointless because we saw basically the exact same thing in both races where drivers would go up to the high side and would not do a damn thing. 
Now in duel number one, they did have a little bit of racing for about, I don't know, five, ten laps. But, um, other than that, duel one was garbage. Duel number two damn near put me to sleep. I mean, I remember watching that race and I was, I'm sitting in my chair and I can feel myself nodding off from how fucking boring it was. I literally had to get up out of my chair, not during a commercial, but I had to get up out of my chair, go to the kitchen and pour myself some damn iced coffee to wake myself back up. That's how bad duel number two was. And the only interesting thing about that one was the pass by Joey Logano on the last lap. I mean, good grief. I mean, when that's the only thing of note out of both of those races, that's pretty bad. And I realize that they're just qualifying races and all that other jazz, but good grief, man. If the races are not going to be interesting whatsoever, then don't put them on television at all. It's a complete waste of fucking time. Then we get to the truck series. The truck series was a lot more interesting than the past three races combined. Only problem is, it pretty much turned into a crash fest. I mean, by the end of it all, there were only nine cars running, or should I say nine trucks running out of 32 that started. The other trucks were completely out of the race. And you know, it's pretty crazy when the artist formerly known as Angela Cope now known as Angela Kooch. Is that how you pronounce it? Kook? I don't know. However you pronounce it, she ended up with a top 10 finish. Which is kind of like... Huh? And uh, we ended up with a first time winner, Austin Hill. He gets his first career win at Daytona, so good for him. And then we get to the Xfinity Series. The Xfinity Series race sucked ass. It sucked ass! It, it basically got to the point where we had choo-choo trains galore for 85-90% of the race. And we had some decent racing, I guess, at the end of stage one. But other than that, this race was total garbage. The only redeeming factor is the fact that Michael Annette got his first career win. After, I think it was like 240 starts. So he had been around for a long while. And he gets his first career Xfinity Series win, and it's in Daytona. So good for him on that one. But now we get to the main race itself. The Daytona 500. And there was a genuine fear coming into this race that, based on what we saw in the Clash and the Duels and the Xfinity Series race, that this was going to be one of the worst 500s in, this, in the race's history because there was a genuine fear that we were going to see nothing but freight trains all race long drivers just you know biding their time and waiting until the end of the race to make their move thankfully enough that was not the case we actually saw two by two racing throughout we, had, we saw runs to try to take the lead we saw unusual leaders like matt de benedetto what for the levine family racing team his first race in that car by the way and i mean he led a good chunk of the race i mean i think he led about a quarter of the race in total and i was like damn and they actually had a car that was good enough to win this race uh, we had Three pure lead changes in the first stage. For those of you that don't know, a pure lead change is when there's a legitimate pass for the lead at the start-finish line uh, during the course of a race. There are three. There are a couple of exceptions to this rule. One, there cannot be a pure lead change on the first lap after a restart. Two, a pure lead change cannot occur if there's like radically different differing uh, pit strategies like someone taking no tires versus someone taking four tires and the difference in speed is well pretty obvious and three purely changes cannot occur during a sequence of pit stops or as the result of the leader coming to pit road those don't count as purely changes other than that though anything else is fair game and we had three pure lead changes in the first stage. So I was like, oh, pretty uh, 
competitive event. Of course, we had a caution that came out right in the middle of uh, green flag pit stops and several guys were coming to pit road and then the caution came out and screwed all of them. There was another caution where Kurt Busch was trying to get around Ricky Stenhouse, uh, came down on him and spun himself out and took Bubba Wallace, uh, Tyler Reddick, uh, Jimmy McMurray with them. Austin Dillon spun out to avoid the accident. Uh, Logano proving that he had one of the best cars of the race because he was making moves around guys all by himself. Uh, Kyle Busch won stage one and uh, he was certainly a factor uh, late in the race as well. Um, a lot of penalties in this race too, either through uh, speeding penalties, uncontrolled tires, pitting too soon. I mean, you name it, there was a lot of penalties in this race. Uh, then we get to stage two, and a very interesting thing kind of happened. Uh, there were a lot of drivers that decided to come down pit road um, early in that stage, much like stage one. Matt Benedetto, along with five other cars, decided to stay out. And those six cars together were running down that giant pack of cars. In the second half of the stage, they were actually trying to lap a lot of good cars, like... Kyle Larson, Denny Hamlin actually went a lap down <clears throat> during that run because he was one of those guys that pit too and Matt Benedetto and Kyle Busch I mean those two were working together along with those other cars I think Chase Elliott was one of those as well and they basically ran the back of that pack down and I'm like holy crap they could put a lot of good cars lap down here including Denny Hamlin which <laughs> Would have been an even bigger deal because during that run i don't know if they had like a problem with one of the fuel cans but apparently they didn't get the fuel all the fuel in that car because um they were telling denny to save fuel because they were about five to eight laps short which is that's a lot of laps on a two and a half mile track which means that they didn't get all the fuel in there that they could have so that was pretty nerve-wracking for Hamlin's team as well because they could have been a lap down legitimately at that point. And Kyle Larson, he was trying his damnedest to stay on the lead lap, uh, trying to race the Benedetto really, really hard. You know? So that was kind of crazy. And then Casey Mears and Parker Kligerman crashed in turn one. I think they were saying that uh, Mears might have broken a track bar. So everybody comes in on that caution for service. Well most everyone. There were actually four cars that stayed out, including Ryan Blaney, who would end up winning stage two. And then all those guys come in for pit stops. William Byron leads the start of stage three. Um, gets challenged a couple of times, but Byron was able to hold him at bay. Then we have a case of Rick Ware racing fail when BJ McLeod and Cody Ware make contact with one another. There were some cars coming to pit road, including Jimmy Johnson. They were slowing down to come to pit road. The Rick Ware cars make contact with each other, spin each other out, um, get into the 31 of Tyler Reddick, who gets shoved into the left rear of Jimmy Johnson, completely rips the left rear quarter panel off of Jimmy Johnson's car, which is right where the fuel insert is. And then the 31 gets pushed into the 17 of Ricky Stenhouse, spins him out. And it's just like, oh my God, what are these back markers doing? You guys are a bunch of fucks. And it was both cars too. Both cars from that team. I mean, that was without a doubt, one of the biggest team fails I've ever seen in NASCAR. And it took out a lot of good contenders, inclu including Jimmy Johnson and Ricky Stenhouse. So everyone comes in for service. Kyle Busch took just two tires and won the race off pit road. And there were a lot of penalties on this pit stop. Truex and Newman got caught for speeding. Uh, Austin Dillon got a penalty for too many men over the wall. Michael McDowell and Ricky Stenhouse was penalized for pitting too soon. And then Johnson was penalized two laps for improper fueling. What happened was the gas man He's only supposed to be fueling the car. And that's the only thing he can do. Apparently he went back and got some uh, tape to help repair the car with and he's not allowed to do that. So that's why Johnson was held for two laps. Uh, Jay Murray stayed out and leads on the restart with 33 laps to go. And I was like, damn, this is his final race and uh, he's got a beat up race car, but he's leading the race. And of course he's a former winner of the 500. He won it back in 2010. 
Uh, Denny Hamlin was able to take over the lead, though, when he made the move around the outside, and then Kyle Busch made the move underneath of Hamlin, making it three, or uh, underneath of uh, McMurray, and uh, basically put McMurray in the middle, and Hamlin was able to take advantage and take over the race lead. Uh, and there was a bit of uh, bumping and banging in the middle of the pack during this point, but uh, the fifth caution came out for debris, and it was actually legitimate debris. In fact, it looked like the back of someone's car came completely off, because that was a pretty big piece. Uh, Logano and Elliott decided to come in for service at this point, which is kind of interesting. So Hamlin leads on the restart. Uh, Eric Jones loses fuel pressure with 21 laps to go. And at this point, I thought, well, his race is over. How he managed to come back and finish third is beyond me. Because he lost fuel pressure with 21 to go. And typically when that happens, it's game over. But he caught a break with uh, the sixth caution when Kyle Larson lost a left rear tire, which is not going to be the last time that happens, and spun out. I think Larson spun out like three times in this race and <clears throat> still came home with a top 10 finish, which is great. And then Brad Keselowski on the next caution loses a left rear tire as well and spins off a turn four, but uh, he was able to get back going again. Hamlin leads with 10 laps to go and... That's when this race went to total shit. And it turned into a demolition derby. With the eight caution of the day on 191, when Matt DiBenedetto um, was getting pushed by Paul Menard. Um, Menard hits his right rear and basically spins him out going into turn three and causes a massive 22 car pileup. Took out a lot of good cars, including De Benedetto, Truex, um, Ryan Newman was involved, Eric Almarola, Suarez, Jimmy Johnson, um, Chase Elliott was involved, Austin Dillon was involved, Joe Lagana got a small piece of it, Kyle Larson got a piece of it. I mean, there were a lot of good cars. William Byron got a piece of it, his left rear quarter panel was completely torn off. I mean, there were a lot of good cars involved in that crash. Um, the red flag would have to be displayed to get it all cleaned up, uh, which lasted about 25 minutes. Uh, Kyle Busch was ahead of uh, Hamlin when the caution was thrown, so he would lead on the restart. And then we would get a caution on lap 196, which was the ninth of the day, when Stenhouse decided to be Stenhouse and tried to force three wide down the backstretch between Kyle Larson and Kevin Harvick. Um, bumps into Harvick, spins him out, gets Stenhouse sideways, uh, gets into uh, Larson, spins him out. Harvick goes head on into the wall, and a couple other cars got involved in that as well. Uh, Keselowski, Ty Dillon was involved, Alex Bowman was involved, and it's just like, oh my god. It's, did everybody just start losing their brains all of a sudden, just start tossing them out the window? I mean, good freaking grief, man. I mean, I realize it's the 500, but all of a sudden, you know, we're getting down into the last 10 laps and, you know, and everybody just starts losing their freaking minds. It's like, what the hell is going on here? Kyle Busch leads on the restart with two laps to go, but he made a decision that would ultimately cost him the win. He opted to start on the inside row for this restart, which was strange because... All the leaders that on the previous restarts were restarting on the outside lane. Yet he decided to choose the inside for this restart. And that's a decision that would ultimately cost him the win because Hamlin started on the outside and got enough of a run to where he was actually ahead of Kyle Busch on the 10th and final caution of the day on lap 199 when uh, Clint Boyer made the move around Michael McDowell and it was a good move but then he tried to sneak up back in front of McDowell and wasn't quite clear of the 34 car and turned himself and had yet another big accident at turn three William Byron was involved Chase Elliott was involved their days were pretty much done uh, Jimmy McMurray was involved Jimmy Johnson and gone, hit the wall hard. Landon Castle smashed that 24 car. I mean, it's a wonder that Byron wasn't 
seriously injured after taking two big hits in the driver's side. And Keselowski was involved and they had to throw yet another red flag to clean that mess up. And at, at this point, it's just like, man, this was such a good race. And then it went and then it just starts going to shit inside of 10 laps to go. I mean, it took almost 90 minutes to finish the last 10 laps of this race. But they eventually get it back going again. Hamlin leads on the restart after a 30 minute red flag. Um, gets in front of Kyle Busch. Joey Logano tried his damnedest to get up there and challenge Hamlin for the win. But uh, Kyle Busch got on his outside and managed to get back to second. Eric Jones actually managed to make it back to third. And uh, Denny Hamlin would win his second Daytona 500 and snaps a 47 race winless streak. And um, it was a hell of a story considering that uh, J.D. Gibbs passed away um, earlier this year. So for Denny Hamlin to win in that 11 car uh, for Joe Gibbs Racing, well, you could pretty you could tell by the emotions in their voice voices. So and uh, Joe Gibbs, I mean, he was just his mind was all over the place when they were interviewing him. But I mean, after everything that he had gone through the previous month or two, could you really blame him? And considering the fact that Joe Gibbs Racing finished one, two, three in the Daytona 500. The first time that had happened since 1997 when Hendrick Motorsports did it with Jeff Gordon, Terry Labonte, and Ricky Craven. Overall, uh, I would say the Daytona 500 delivered. I mean, it definitely went to shit in the last 10 laps when it started turning into a complete demo derby, which I can't freaking stand. But we still got a decent finish, you know, an emotional winner. And overall... I mean, especially considering, you know, what we were fearing this race to be, I would say the 2019 Daytona 500 uh, delivered. So, my final rating for the 2019 Daytona 500, the 61st edition, um, I'm going to go ahead and give it a 7 out of 10. It was honestly a very interesting Daytona 500 uh, a lot of interesting viewpoints. I mean, it's a pretty good start to the season. I mean, it, it honestly would have scored a lot better had we not started wrecking all those cars in the last 10 laps. But overall, it was still a solid Daytona 500 and a good start to the season. Next week is when the true test starts with this new aero package. Atlanta Motor Speedway, the Folds of Honor Quick Trip 500. And we're going to find out once and for all if this package is the total package or a complete and total um, clusterfuck. We don't know what's going to happen, but it's um, going to be interesting to find out. That's for damn sure. And uh, hopefully it'll do what it was designed to do. Invoke close racing and lots of lead changes and all that good stuff. Something that I think a lot of fans have been aching for for quite a while. So... I don't know if it'll work on an aging surface like Atlanta, because let's be honest here, Atlanta has, it's long since passed its prime, but it'll be interesting to see what happens with this uh, new era package. So uh, that's going to do it uh, for this review. Thank you very much for watching. And uh, until next time, this is the Packer Man signing out.